Thanks for joining us at the Business Growth Cafe, where each week we select from a menu of topics for a focused discussion with an industry expert to provide insights that can impact your business's growth with your host, Angelo Ponzi. I am Angelo Ponzi, your host here at the Business Growth Cafe, and thank you for joining us. Each week we select from a menu of topics that can impact business growth to discuss with experts from a wide variety of disciplines. And today at the cafe, we're going to do something a little bit different. First, I want to thank all of you that have been listening to the show. It is really greatly appreciated. And I'm excited about the lineup we have for the coming year. However, while many of you have been listening to the show since the beginning, we have newcomers to the show that have only been listening the last two or three episodes. So for this year-end show, I've decided to give you a little look back into the archives of the Business Growth Cafe. Today's show will give you some highlights, one or two, from the guests that we've had on the shows. Hopefully they'll pique your interest to want to go back and listen to those shows. So this will be a buffet of information that you can use today, as well as the beginning of your planning for the coming year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. And thank you for joining me at the Business Growth Cafe. Well, these are just a few highlights from my conversation with Jack Kelly, CEO of Accorlay Group. I hope you enjoy. There's a like a time frame or a, a size of company where the uh, as they start to grow and the owner, you know, a lot of cases we're both business people and we do yeah. a lot of selling ourselves. Right. At some point in time, we, when you need to scale, when we need to scale, is there triggers or is there some kind of milestones that that we should look at as business owners to take that next step? Yeah, it's a really good question. And the thing I consistently see is business owners, CEOs trying to offload sales versus transition sales. Okay. And so usually I see it anywhere from three to five years, depending upon the type of business that they're in. And they just think they can hire to solve the sales problem. It's like, oh, I can finally get that off my plate. I don't have to worry about it anymore. And uh, what ends up happening is they say, okay, I'll hire somebody with experience from my industry and they can take the ball and run with it. What often happens is they hire a salesperson uh, maybe give them a morning of training about you know who the company is and that sort of thing. It says go get them Tiger, and they don't think about all the tools they may need. Perhaps some of the transition of mm-hmm. what I call that tribal knowledge. A lot okay. of folks make assumptions, especially CEOs and founders of business, that somebody will think the way they do. Well, they generally don't. They may have the skill set, but unless you actually train that person, provide the time to mentor and bring that person along, and then give them the tools to do it. Uh, I've unfortunately seen some good salespeople fail in those situations when if some time had been taken up front, it's kind of like I say, the paint, uh, prepping to paint a room. Right. It's a pain in the neck to do the taping and everything else. But once you do it, it turns out a lot better when you do it that way versus it. What's your thought process on, on kind of a, just the best practices for onboarding and developing onboarding campaigns? It is the most critical point in your relationship with an employee, whether that be sales or anybody else. Hey, YouTube, and, don't and I you see go uh, companies fail at this all the time. And as a matter of fact, over the summer, I just worked with uh, a great technology company uh, in San Diego called Retail Ops and their CEO, Sam Moses. And um, we worked specifically on this as he was ready to grow his sales team. Um, but he understood enough that if I don't transfer the knowledge properly, I'm set up to fail. So um, we spent uh, a few weeks figuring that out, working with him and his team on what were the different pieces of the organization they needed to understand first before he threw them out to sell. Now, part of this was learning on the job with them, but we had very specific steps, milestones, and timelines related to each part of the business. And it wasn't just sales. It also had to do with their development team and what they do and understanding the cause and effect relationships there. So um, I actually developed a model for it uh, in a master's program years ago that I continue to use with clients to this day. And I would say it's probably the least paid attention to paid attention to part of a business that people have. I would agree with that. Y- you know, it's interesting too, and we, a lot of times we want to get the product knowledge, we want to get out there and start to make the sales, but as, as a marketing guy, a lot of times when I think about brand, uh, I struggle a lot of times with clients that the sales people and the frontline people, even even the inside, just don't have a clear picture and, and an understanding of what the brand is. Absolutely. So I always counsel that you know you have to market inside and outside yep. in order to make sure that everybody's telling the same story. Mm-hmm. We talk about you know putting people on the streets and and you know doing that sales and 
and my motto has always been over the years of being in the advertising business and marketing consultant and having the opportunity been client side that new business is the lifeblood of any company. So what do you see as the biggest challenge for companies when it comes to business development or, or prospecting? Yeah, when it comes to prospecting now, it's 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 a decision you have to understand, I think, even more acutely who your target customers are okay. uh, by industry and then also the buyers within those customers. Do, do, do you find that, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. do you find that, that companies spend the time really developing those buyer personas and understanding the, the different levels of sell, right? Is there's the, I always look at it, there's the initiator who started the project, right. there's the, the evaluator, <laughs> yeah. and there's the, you know, the person that writes the check. Yeah, and absolutely. so there's always multiple levels, but mm -hmm. I find, it, it, to my dismay still, that people don't spend the time to understand, to your point, who that customer really is. Well, and it's becoming, I think, more and more important, and, and here's why, is because with the dawn of the different ways we can connect with people now, whether that be social media, email, uh, events, um, still can be very effective for some some firms. Uh, even some folks, I had a guy, guy cold call me today and actually worked, believe it or not. Okay. <laughs> uh, that still does happen, but generally those are warmer now. But in order to do that effectively, you have to spend the time understanding who your ideal prospect is. Because let's say you're, you're a CEO of a $20 million company. Mm -hmm. And my conversation with you should be very different than my conversation would be even with the CFO of exactly. that company. If I'm not understanding where you derive value from what I do and tailor my conversation or my approach or my email or my outreach to you that way, then I'm spinning my wheels. And what's happening is, is quite frankly, this technology and the ability to do this is becoming more and more affordable for small businesses right. to do this. And so their competition's doing it. And if you're not, you're going to get left behind. Right. Because it is, uh, to your point, it's the buyer's journey. Yep. It's about the buyer profile and yep. looking at what stage they are and the yep. way they consume information. If you're at the early stages doing an evaluation, mm -hmm. very different how you talk to them versus if they're actually at the decision to buy. Gary Sainer, CEO of Primero Systems, joins us on the show. Again, I hope you enjoy the highlights from his interview. Uh, uh, service-oriented companies that are listening today, and when they're thinking about rolling out a product, mm -hmm. is there one piece of advice or two pieces of advice you would give them? Oh, gosh. Or I'll, more than I'll, that. I'll, yeah. I'll, we need I'll, another show. <laughs> I'll, repeat, I'll repeat the sales and marketing aspect because okay. I don't think the challenge is going to be to develop a commercial-grade um, software product that always works. I think as a software provider, that's a given. You um, you have to be successful in your technology suite. Um, however, for an engineer, and most software companies start as engineering companies uh, or with engineering talent, it is a different discipline altogether to master what it takes to successfully market and communicate and to show value um, to your customer okay. base. So basically, do not follow the field of dreams syndrome. Build it and they will come. That's exactly yeah. right. All right. And That's we've fine. been we've been victims of that. We we certainly have thought it was just a great idea. And by and large, they have been good ideas, but they've been terribly uh, promoted to the public. From a marketing execution, uh, uh, how you build sales leads and. Ah, uh, very like good. That. Okay. See, again, <laughs> did I underscore my lack of marketing <laughs> expertise here? Um, so, yes, what we've, what we've really uh, learned over the last um, 18 months or so, the value of research. We've hired a, a company that uh, came in, uh, took a look at what our products and services were, uh, mapped them to a potential buyer base, and really help clarify how we could address that market in a more succinct and intelligent manner. So I think market research is incredibly valuable uh, just in terms of the tools and techniques that we've used. We've, we've gone out, we've bought the mailing list. That didn't work at all. Um, we've very successfully introduced ourselves to a broad audience using LinkedIn. Okay. So we're getting a lot of activity and a lot of interest by being able to go out to the, say, the laboratory marketplace with our offerings and, and expertise. And we're getting a lot of sea level uh, responses from that. That's great. Which we've just generated more interest um, in the last 18 months than we have in the previous 24 years. Paul Peffer, founder and CEO of Tax Relief Assistance, joins us on the show.
This is a business show, so let's start with a discussion about some of the key changes in the new tax law. I think it's officially called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. That is a mouthful. I thought they'd do a better job at branding that. Uh, maybe they need to give me a call so I can take yeah. care of some of that. Just now, there is um, a new 21% new corporate tax rate for C corporations. However, if I, my reading is correct, that does not apply to non C corps. That's correct. It's only C corporations. It's, uh, it doesn't apply to any pass through entities like LLCs or uh, uh, an S corporation or a sole proprietor. Um, so that 21% is strictly for corporations taxed as corporations. Okay. So I'm an LLC. So obviously I, I thought I was going to get this 21%. I'm not. So what do I get out of all this as a, as a LLC? No, you can still get the deduction as an LLC. Okay. Um, you, um, the, not, you can't get the 21% tax rate. With the QBI, the Qualified Business uh, okay. Deduction, the 20% for pass-through entities, uh, you can get down to an effective tax rate of about um, 29%. All right. Okay, it's not as close as 21, but it's certainly better than... It's in the 20s. Being in the, uh, <laughs> better than being in the 30s. So um, um, that is going to be the biggest challenge for everybody this year, is how to take and how to calculate that QBI deduction. But uh, as an LLC... Um, you certainly are entitled to uh, take that deduction. Okay. So with these new tax, t tax changes coming along, I, I'm, a, I'm not a betting man, but I would bet that a lot of businesses are not prepared, especially small to medium-sized businesses, to really incorporate and take advantage of these. And, of course, in a few months, the clock is going to run out. We're going to hit January 1st and whatever th kind of plans they had to take and do before they hit the end of the year are going to bypass them. So for the audiences out there, are there any recommendations or tips you can give our listeners uh, to help them avoid uh, year-end 2018 tax issues that they can prepare properly for, uh, for this new tax law? Yeah, I guess the, the first one would be don't wait till the end of 2018 <laughs> to try and to, uh, do this. Um, I would immediately, uh, since we have pretty good guidance from the IRS now, um, get together with um, a tax consultant, um, and um, see first if your business qualifies for the 20% qualified uh, or pass-through uh, deduction. Okay. That would be the first one I do. Uh, the second one is um, to make sure that uh, they're in compliance if they have been able to make quarterly estimated tax returns. Uh, certainly um, the payroll taxes, which are called trust fund taxes, you can never be late on, and you can't be late on the reports. Okay. The, the, the big, you know. Uh, uh, do, 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 I'm going to interrupt for a second, but where do where do businesses typically typically get in trouble? Is it payroll tax? Is it sales tax? Is it filing their quarterlies or all of the above? Well, it's all of the above or more. First off, one of the big ones I have that I have personally seen is uh, individuals that have come in and have mixed personal and business expenses, where they'll use the same credit card for both and then just hand me the credit card statement like I'm supposed to, <laughs> to, to know which ones. Uh, but um, so that and improperly setting up their accounting, not having somebody help them, thinking, you know, I mean, Intuit has promoted that you don't need to be an accountant to use QuickBooks. I would disagree. I would disagree <laughs> as well. <laughs> so um, they, they usually come in with some mixture of the both, and so it becomes an accounting project before a tax project. But um, the other things um, that uh, business can do before the end of this year, um, we have in 2018 um, a bonus depreciation, So um, and the limits, like for Section 179 expensing, have gone from five hundred thousand dollars up to a million, so you can write off a hmm. uh, million dollars. I wish. And uh, in property, in the first year, um, you can take the bonus depreciation. There is a schedule on uh, cars, but um, it's substantially more eighteen thousand dollars the first year versus ten thousand. But um, a lot of those things, you know, 
it should be done earlier in the year. You right, know, if right. you're planning to buy company cars or something, you know, you need to know about that before the end of the year and plan for it. So with three months left of the end of the year, making these moves are maybe not as beneficial if they had done it last January, February. Wayne Pinnell, managing partner of Haskell and White, had a lot of interesting things to say when it comes to mergers and acquisitions. Um, I've been reading a lot of your blogs recently and, and certainly have enjoyed, uh, enjoyed them. And one in particular talks about uh, what I think the goal of, of many small businesses are is to someday be fortunate enough to sell their business. Now, I, I've had that opportunity to sell my business uh, several years ago. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm not quite sure, it came on us really quick. So we were neophytes and, and really didn't have the time to plan and probably do it properly and, and contact people like yourself. So let's start there in our conversation. Uh, in your blog, you call it the six P's or key areas to focus on in preparing for a sale. Uh, I'll just read them off real quick and then you can expound upon all of those uh, products and services, profits, uh, process for delivery, practices, people, and certainly planning to be prepared. So let's let's start the conversation there. Sure. Uh, you know, it, it dawned on me to prepare this blog at one point. I was just driving home trying to think about the things that I'll talk to a number of clients about throughout the, the work week, um, really getting this down to if you're going to plan for a sale, what key things, if you, if you put the shoes on the other feet, so to speak, would the buyers be looking at? And so when I just kind of came up with something that made sense to get six P's and to work the words around a little bit. But clearly the, the business that you have in the first place, what is the business you have? What's the unique proposition that you are, are providing or fulfilling in the marketplace through your product or your service? Because okay. that's going to be a, a huge value driver in what somebody might be looking to bolt on to their existing business or, or create a vertical situation that they might be looking at. Certainly, as you're developing products and services, you want to be generating profits because investors are looking at you not necessarily on your history, but where you're going, which is going to be based on the track record and looking at where you intend to take that business because they are looking for a return. Wouldn't you expect? They're looking for a return on the investment, and that's going to come from, from future growth and profits. And processes for delivery can cover anything for... Uh, depending on your business, it's how you get your product to market. Okay. Is it distribution through public warehouses? Is it distribution through distributors or a network of salespeople? Franchising, whatever it might be, that's going to have its own value drivers as well to keep you there. And um, number four was practices. It's all about the organization and the governance of the company. Okay. Um, how well is it run? It gets into the management team. Actually, I'll keep management team for people, but it uh, gets into how you run the company, how good the controls are for the company, the enterprise systems that you have in place. Is, that, it, does, is culture part of the evaluation as well? Yeah, culture will be a intangible value that certainly somebody's going to look at and see if your business will blend well with them. And a lot of that culture is going to be in that fifth P with the people. Okay. Um, you know, it's often said that companies look at three important things when they're buying somebody else. It's management, management, and management. Uh -huh. But that's all the people. And so it's really looking at... Um, how that company's been structured. And for a small business, one way to look at it is if the owner was to walk away tomorrow or retire, can that company run without him right. or her? Uh, can that, is that company been so well built and so well positioned through its practices and procedures that the people can just go without the family? I talk a lot about market dynamics and presentations that I give, and, and there's so many different aspects, which is really part of the foundation for this idea of the Business Growth Cafe. There's so many things that can influence and impact a business along the way. In those days, I would tell my clients, the day I present you the strategic plan or the business plan or advertising plan, whatever it was, the minute you say, yes, I love it, it just changed. Something <laughs> happened out there that had an impact, whether it was the competition or, or interest rates went up or something happened in the economy or politics and things like that. So there's really a lot about keeping the pulse. And I find so many times in, in, in the small to medium-sized businesses and, frankly, even larger businesses that I've dealt with is – that consistency of keeping a pulse on the market to help make changes and evolve those changes and incorporate those changes as the days go by to make sure you're not waiting till quarterly or whatever it happens to be to make changes to your plan. What about uh, your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's exactly true. I think, you know, if you go back 20 years, people used to do the strategic plan and it ended up in 20, 30, 40 pages in a three ring notebook. And, you know, we kid a lot about that today because, you know, on day 363, knowing the meeting was in two days, they pulled it off the shelf, blew the dust off it, and tried to figure <laughs> out what they were supposed to have done. And um, you, you, we actually promulgate an idea of, of something we call a one page plan, trying to make it really simple. 
uh, identify a couple core key strategies that are going to have to be played out and then really focus on those and move the needle. But you're right, what, what your comment is, you've got to be aware of what's going on around you because the plan sounds good today, but you have to be willing to step back and see three months from now, is that still where I want to go? Right. Um, what progress have I made? Do I need to do a course correction? You know, change course completely. Um, what's going on in, in competition, the marketplace, the industry, regulatory environment? All those things are not going to be the same a year from now, less well, three or five years from now, depending on how far out you're looking. Right. So if you want to really, and I always look, try to look out five years and make sure next year, the first year and the second year is as solid as they can be because, as to your point, things will change. You made a comment about the one-page strategic plan, and those are always interesting because, I mean, I've, I'm the guy that has written the 100-page plans and literally have watched my clients blow the dust I, off them. I had them, too. <laughs> <laughs> and so as we drive and strive to, to make them, I'll say, thinner, not necessarily simpler because it forces, I believe, the, the participants to be really focused and succinct in what they're putting on that page and, and really committed, com, uh, committing to it because you can't hide it in the multiple pages that are right. going on. Um, who, who in your team or the client's team, I mean, I always look at first-line managers as the kind of the participants, the people that ultimately have to execute the plan and be responsible for the plan should be the ones contributing the plan as opposed to senior management just creating something and pushing it down. Well, I, I think that's key because if you don't have buy-in or even contribution of ideas, it's a lot harder to sell it that this is where we're going, now help me do it. If they're involved in the planning process, it helps drive the ultimate strategy. So, so for us, I break it down into two broad categories. I've got a my management team. Mm -hmm. We go off site and we spend some hours going through uh, issues that they look at from the management, which is obviously looking up and looking down on an organization. Take those ideas to the partner group, add those things on top of it, and we come up with a plan that you know you you can show the trail that it has smatterings of everybody's ideas in there. Okay. Uh, the one page plan thing though is. Um, that's actually something you can use with the organization. You can use it as your individual. You, I've done it with nonprofits. You can use it for your family. I mean, it's just a way of getting something down on, on one simple architected script, if you will, to show you where you want to go and have you give you a place to monitor it and see if you're making progress. Nancy Drew, health and wellness expert, talks about the importance of keeping your employees happy. Programs that make the employees happier and improve the you know their health at the same time. Uh, what how that helps companies is that there's a huge cost to having unhappy employees. You know how much you get done when you don't mm -hmm. really feel like it. You're not productive and turnover is high. Um, health expenses are out of control. Uh, there's absenteeism. So when a, a company has a culture of happiness and people enjoy being there, it's just the best competitive advantage that you can have. Right. There's certainly, uh, obviously, increasing productivity as you go along because of that happiness. So, you know, in a, in a recent Gallup uh, survey, about 70% of American workers are unhappy or simply disengaged in their jobs. And, and according to the survey, actually about 20% even hate their jobs. So how are companies really dealing with this issue to ensure their disengaged workers are not impacting their bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a huge issue because um, happy workers don't stay, or sorry, unhappy workers don't stay. So what the stat is right now in the U.S. is that 89% of companies have a corporate wellness or a health and wellness program of some kind. And, you know, they, they take different forms and they do see a return on investment. That's what people are looking for. Is it, Does it pay for itself? The answer is yes, it does. And, you know, for a corporate wellness program, and that's what we help people do is kind of find out what is happening right now. How, what's the temperature of the employees? Are they going to stay? Are they going to go? Are they engaged? You know, how productive are they? And create programs that are helpful. So how do you establish that base, right? Is that through an employee mm -hmm. survey or what, what's kind of the, the, your first steps to help evaluate a company of their, their employee happiness, if mm -hmm. you will? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what we do do is we do do a, a survey. So some of it, it's a self-reporting with the um, an anonymous survey with the employees. We do some one-on-one -on -one interviewing. We get uh, data from the HR group, and and you know we really don't suggest change for the sake of change. Right. You know, right. there's got to be something connect it, something factual on this. And then we roll that up for the company and we say, okay, here's here's where we're we're 
busy and not productive. Here's where the opportunities are. So we calculate, you know, the hours, the um, the the cost in wages. Uh, possibly, you know, we're looking at, you know, a lot of times they're paying way too much on their health care costs because they don't have programs like this in place. In those in those kinds of programs, help drive down in, in health care costs, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. Yeah. Like for one company, um, they have had a uh, what is their savings? $136 per employee per month on their health care costs, you wow. know, reduction. So it's it's significant. Now, so if I'm a small business, mm-hmm. you just painted a big picture mm-hmm. and something that's, I'm going to say, I don't know if I can afford all that stuff or frankly have the time or the bandwidth to do that. Mm-hmm. But I think, to re, you know, as long as you're not a solopreneur and you've got any kind of employees, I mean, ultimately you don't want turnover. And and so how do you how do you work with an organization or or what should organizations look look at when they're considering these programs as far as what's is there a priority that this is kind of the first step you need to do or the second step and so let's give them some tips and tricks if you will and things that they should consider when they start thinking about these kinds of programs. It's uh, you can have a, a well happiness program, an employee culture program, whatever you want to call it. You know. At any level, that might be that you have standing desks that you know you stand for half the time, you sit down for half the time. Your meetings could be that you go for a walk and you record it. That's what I do. With okay. you know, we we walk. Uh, you could have potlucks, healthy events. You could do something. You go build a, a house for a habitat. You can do as much or as little as you want. If your employees are just showing up and they don't have the energy and they're not engaged and you're trying to roll out new programs and they are not you know, behind that, you've got the going out of business business plan. You know, you, you said something earlier and let's, let's talk about employee turnover a little bit. And certainly mm-hmm. there's lots of costs that go with onboarding an individual and, and looking at the tenure of someone if they're in and out very quickly because they were unhappy or frankly you brought in the wrong people. But, you know, from that happiness standpoint if people aren't don't have that job satisfaction right we said a little bit earlier 70 percent of the american workforce is disengaged or unhappy in their job Mm -hmm. so what is that cost do you have any numbers that translate that 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 the audience can you really kind of put into practical use in the sense of saying it's going to cost me x to onboard somebody what kind of investment should i be making in their training and their happiness and welfare uh, wellness to make sure that they don't leave Right. Okay. So here's the the stats on that. Uh, what we're seeing is 90 days after onboarding, people are jumping off. You know, they're gone. They don't like it. They're out of there. Typically, those people leaving are your high performers. High performers, great talent will not stay if it's not the culture that they want. You know, so the number one reason for them leaving, uh, for anyone leaving right now in an organization, is I don't see that there's any advancement for me, number one. Okay. Um, number two is uh, my boss, you know, is horrific. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, number three is this culture isn't doing it for me and they're out the door. Now to replace that person, it's 40% of the salary. Yikes. It's, it's expensive. So what happens is we replace, then we turn over because we don't have those things in place. Stephanie Podick, president of Podick Law, joins us next to talk about the importance of protecting your IP. People have this tendency to just go grab a picture off the internet because they think because it's there, it's free. Right. But the reality is somebody else really owns that. So what's free, what isn't free, and what kind of trouble can someone get into by using somebody else's, let's say, photograph or, or talking about their trademark and not giving them the proper credit? Right. So that's a the, that's a great point you bring up and all great questions. Ooh, thank you very much. The random hands coming in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so effectively, I get that a lot. People always say, well, it's on the internet, it's on social media, I should be able to use it. But unfortunately, uh, most of the times, it's probably a copyrighted image. image. So that means someone else uh, owns it and has the rights to use it and the rights to control who uses it. So if you pull something off the internet and someone finds you, let's say Getty Images is a good example because that's what they do. They they have a number of images that they've protected and they search uh, different websites and blogs and look for the you know unauthorized use of their images. And they'll send a letter and say basically, well, 
you, you know, we found you using it. It doesn't matter if it's a blog. It doesn't matter if you intended to. It doesn't matter if you made money from it. We're going to, you know, they threatened to sue for um, up to $150,000, which is uh, per copyright per, violation. Per copyright. It's, right. It's under the copyright statute. That's why it's very, very smart to get a copyright registration if you can. Very cost effective. And the damages are, you know, sometimes Pretty, uh, disproportionate. Right. So, well, that certainly yeah. could have an impact on your bottom line if you're getting hit with a $150,000 uh, federal lawsuit. Sure. Well, for some people, and that's just the damage, some people that would that would bankrupt their company. And legal fees also with litigation can get to be $100,000, $200,000, and, and, and more. What are three or five actions or tips that you can give the audience that they should kind of check their status of their 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 marks and and the usage of photographers whatever it happens to be so what are some guidelines that you can provide the audience okay so for pretty much any business there are a few steps you can take one identify what intellectual property the business has okay. two make sure you own the intellectual property three is protect the intellectual property to the extent it makes sense to um, then to make sure that everything is in writing, that you know what your contracts say. Read your contracts, definitely important. Read those. Read. And um, then also to have website policies if you have a website. So and privacy policies, policies, privacy, terms and conditions. Correct, because those will help prevent lawsuits from the government. And, and by and the way, I'm going to interrupt. Consumers. Yeah. But don't download those from the, those from the internet either yes. and assume that what you can buy for yes. free or steal from somebody else's website yes. applies to you. Yes, it could be copyright infringement and probably it's not actually, um, you know, explaining what your business is doing. You know, ha having been in marketing a long time, I commission a lot of people for whether it's photography or, or artwork and things like that. And, and I'll pick on photography because so many times, you know, we hire a photographer to shoot and then find out we got to pay a gazillion dollars to actually use the pictures. And then we're limited based on, oh, it's just going to be a picture on the Internet versus an ad or social media. And the price points tend to go up. So uh, it, my always thinking is, and you can validate this or, or have your side of it, is to try to negotiate all this up front so you understand what its ultimate cost is going to be based before you hire somebody to make sure that it's affordable, if you will. Sure. So whether it's someone, uh, you hire someone to take photographs or you hire someone for a logo or whatever creative work you're hiring someone, take a video, something like that. Um, you should know up front that the default is the person who takes the photo, creates the logo, the creator, uh, effectively has those copyrights. And the only way for you as the person commissioning or paying for the rights to those, um, you know, to, to the copyrights is to get it in writing. Mm -hmm. And the writing has to have specific language and it has to be signed by both parties. That's, that's the ideal. So, so yes, so negotiating it all up front, knowing that fact, and then negotiating is huge advantage. So that's so that's really getting the rights and the usage just transferred to you and as much as possible. But I think this is the, an important part of the conversation for those of you listening out there to really take to heart because we tend not to think about, even though we might sign a contract, realizing that we don't have those long-term rights or our ultimate usage. And at any point in time, the illustrator, for example, if I hired somebody to do a logo and I don't get those rights transferred to me, he could potentially come back in years and say, man, you were a little tiny company. Now you're, you're a big company and I want more money for the work I did. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's why it's important to understand the issues up front, identify them. And then, as you were saying earlier, negotiate uh, maybe ownership rights. And if I'm a business owner, typically, uh, you know, when we were in the toy business, we wanted to own everything. You don't want anyone else holding, you know, holding the, the shoe over sure. your head. Yeah, well, I look at think about brands, I think about something that's ownable, sustainable and leverageable. And certainly, it needs to be ownable. So people can't frankly knock you off really easily. Talking about SEO strategies is Steve Pitchford, account manager at search optimizers. So every website has something called domain authority. And so it's based on a lot of different signals that Google looks at. But um, the local shoe shiner is going to have a lot lower <laughs> domain authority than, okay. let's say, the Wall Street Journal. So the stronger the domain authority of those that are linking into your website, in other words, they have a link on your website driving back to your website traffic, 
the better that signal. And that's a ranking signal that Google looks at. Another, another, in fact, uh, I think content would be the number one signal. Um, links would be the second, those links coming into your website, how strong they are. And the third would be content. So those are, I'm sorry, uh, rank brain. So those are the top three. All right, so content being stuff I'm pushing out, for example. But the backlinks then are really, if I, I'm, I say I'm a guest blogger on, on your website, and those links would link back to my website, if that's what I'm understanding. Exactly. Okay. So uh, SEO, you mentioned, is, is organic. And, and it's like branding. It takes time to really take effect. And one of the things I find a lot of times is when we're dealing with small to medium-sized business, and, I, I, and forgive me, audience, for saying this, it's patience, right? It's about patience building the brand. It's about patience to have things work. So what's a good time frame if I'm going to counsel one of my clients and say, look, it, we're going to run some SEO, but you've got to give it X amount of time for it really start to, to generate what it's supposed to be doing? And I think that depends on each situation. It's how much content you're going to be generating over time. It's how aggressive you are with your on-page optimization techniques. Um, and it's also about the competition and how strong they are, how entrenched they are in the marketplace. But I would say, generally speaking, uh, you should start to see ranking improvements in one to two months. Okay. Um, you should start to see page one positions in two to four months. And you should start to see ROI somewhere between six to twelve months. Okay. So, so really, and I talk about patience. Then this is a, this is a, the long game, if you will. If you're looking for a quick hit in, in fast conversions using organic, um, it's not going to happen that quickly. Exactly. Unless you've got, you know, unless it's a really unusual situation, I would say if you want a campaign, if you want kick, quick results then go with SEM to I'm a huge believer and supporter of integrated marketing. I, I you know, I don't believe in silver bullets unless we're killing werewolves or uh, I want to play a Lone Ranger on a given <laughs> Saturday night. But if I look at integrated marketing, what is really the is there a combination of tactics that you see with SEO that really work the best to help uh, bring this program home? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look back at, you know, the monster in the market is Google, right? And so 95% of traffic is, is flowing through organic results. And what the magnet is right there for what Google wants to see is that you're answering those questions at night that are, are keeping people up in their industry. Um, and we've become, uh, you know, Google has now really shifted to uh, voice search and mobile search. And so we have to shift our content towards that natural language. Um, but I would say at the top of the heap is really building great content, knowing who your audience is, and really servicing them. Google is looking at brands to publish and provide information to their audience. Okay. You mentioned voice search. Can you, can you explain a little bit more about that? I mean, I know we've got all the uh, devices at home and Alexa and, and whatever the other ones are now. There's a ton of them, Cortona and, and those kinds of things. So how is voice playing a role in, in search? Well, it's playing a huge role. Gro uh, voice search is growing exponentially. And obviously, we've, we've had Siri. We've been able to do voice search with our phones for a while. But now the boxes are really starting to uh, grow that type of search. And what it's doing is it's elongating the queries. And so the boxes are talking to us like they're, they're people. Right. And so we're talking back to them like <laughs> they under, really understand us, you know. And so a lot of who, what, why, when, and where questions are being asked. And so these queries are getting a lot longer. And you might look like in a, a simple query about an industry um, and, and see what Google comes up with called an instant answer. It's right on the landing page of the search engine results page. And then it gives you a list of other questions that the audience is asking. And most are very simple. They can be answered in about four lines of copy. But that's the shift we see. It's more conversational copy and longer tail phrases that are being searched. So, so when you're saying that we need to answer the questions that are being asked, so really it's, it's understanding what those questions are so we can help make sure that the copy we're putting on our website and in our content are answering those questions. Exactly, and Google is actually telling us that. In, like after, under the instant answer, they have something called people also ask. If you click one of those questions, 
you actually get, you know, four questions. You click another one, you get five, you get six. They'll give you tons of questions that your audience is asking about, and it's a great FAQ strategy. And business futurist, author, and keynote speaker, Patrick Swartfager talks about AI and machine learning and the impact it's going to have on your employees, your business, and the growth of your future. Also in your book, you talked about social bots, Siri, Google Now, Alexa, Cortona. So what is social bot technology and how is that going to play a role in, in really in our lives and marketing? What kind of businesses are going to probably be early, early adopters of that and beyond? And, yeah. and how is that going to work? Well, so the, the, it falls into a couple of categories. So a uh, chatbot generally refers to human being talking to a machine via text. Uh, social bot refers to a human being talking to a machine versus natural language, like actually having a conversation. And, and there's people define these things a little bit differently, but that's a, a simple way to look at it. And then there's this thing called the Turing test, which is uh, a gentleman by the name of Turing way back in, I think, the 60s. But anyway, the idea is at what point can the human being no longer distinguish the machine from another human being? And via chatbot, in other words, via text, arguably we're already there. So people already are at a point where they can't necessarily tell that this is a machine because it seems so real. It seems so human. Mm -hmm. But on the social bot, it's less so. It's behind, right? But that is what, and we talked about this earlier, that technology is evolving very quickly right now. So the question is, where is it going to propagate? And there's really two different buckets there. And the first one we already talked about, it's the call centers. And I think that in the years ahead, as little as three to five years, most large brands will have to have some sort of natural language interface to communicate with their customers, particularly the younger customers. Okay. So that's going to come very quickly. But the other one is companionship robots. And so or companionship technologies where you could have companions for, like in other words, robotic companions for seniors. You can even have, believe it or not, robotic companions for, for, for middle-aged people, even single men, where, where we're seeing this propagate where these technologies are there. And we have to keep in mind, for example, that there are, there's a deficit of 30 million women in China compared to men of the same age, largely a result of the one-child policy. So 30 million men are mathematically incapable of finding a female partner. There's a 40 million deficit in India, 70 million between those two countries. So that is a market and it's a profitable market and so we see development there as well. So it's really uh, call centers on the one hand and companionship on the other. Thank you again for joining us at the cafe today. We hope you enjoyed this buffet of information. We look forward to seeing you in 2019. If you have any questions about the show or about myself, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find out more about me, read my blogs, watch show videos at, videos at theponzagroup.com or connect with me on LinkedIn as well. You can also subscribe to the show at thebusinessgrowthcafe.com. We are also now on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and Streaker, and coming soon to iHeartRadio. Join me next year for lunch at the Business Growth Cafe. Thank you for listening to today's discussion at the Business Growth Cafe with your host, Angelo Ponzi. Take a moment to subscribe to this podcast and visit our website at www.businessgrowthcafe.com. Read Angelo Ponzi's blogs at www.theponzigroup.com.